June 15th. We were ordered to get out at daylight, as we had no rations. General Hancock didn't move with his accustomed celerity. About 10 a.m., we started on the road to Petersburg, 14 miles away. General Hancock's instructions were wrong, and he stumbled and blundered around so that we didn't reach the vicinity of the city, till dark. We then seemed to be wandering around without any aim. We marched and countermarched until we began to think we would pass the entire night in this way. We finally located near some heavy earthwork, captured by Butler this p.m., and having drawn rations, lay down for the night. This is a very powerful line of works, comparable to the defenses of Richmond, and if the Johnnies can't hold them, they must be poorly manned. All night we heard the whistling of the engines as the cars came from Richmond loaded with troops for Lee. Surely he now knows that Petersburg, not Richmond, is Grant's objective. By morning the works at Petersburg were fully manned and bristling with bayonets ready to deal out death. Our feelings may be imagined as we listened and reflected that every carload of rebels is so much the more for us to contend with. June 16th. This morning showed us our close proximity to some towering earthworks ones captured yesterday. I was admiring the valor of our troops, who had captured them when my cogitations were brought to an inglorious termination by the explosion of a shell over our heads. Our southern friends were opening the ball. Captain John Perry, who was in command of the regiment, was gouged in the leg and compelled to retire. A few others were disabled and went to the rear. Captain Ben Pennell now assumed command, and we earnestly pray that he will prove an abler leader than Perry. A worse one, he cannot be. At 6 a.m. we moved to the left and formed in line in front of a Confederate redoubt, not far from the Avery House, and near where the rebel works covered the Petersburg and Norfolk Railroad. We suppose we were to entrench there, and this was General Hancock's order. The idea of deliberately inviting annihilation was not our intention, but old Tommy Egan of our brigade thought differently. He desires two things, to add another star on his shoulder straps and to wreak vengeance on his old regiment, the 40th New York, or Mozart Regiment, whose term of service expires in two days. Some members of this outfit have been obnoxious to the gallant Tommy, and probably he thought it an excellent chance to repay them. As soon as we had formed in line among the felled timber and stumps, he ordered us forward to attack a breastwork well manned and containing artillery. The Confederates didn't wait for us to commence the attack, but opened on us with extraordinary briskness. And here for the first and only time, I saw a cannonball in motion. Stacy and the writer, standing side by side, were looking intently at the rebel works when we saw a puff of smoke, and in it we could see the ball. This was so fascinating that we kept our eyes on it, although it was coming straight for our heads. We were riveted to the spot. All of this occurred in a very few seconds. Before I could utter a word, it passed between our heads and bedded itself in the stumps behind us. The charging party consisted of the 40th New York, the 99th Pennsylvania, and the 17th Maine. As the 40th has but two days more to put in, they decided to place themselves in as safe a place as possible, and only swung around under the cover of the line of works in our front. They had small notion of butting their heeds against rebel shells in sewer senseless movement. Tommy Egan is a third-rate idiot. It is a wonder that the men didn't rebel and not move at all, and a still greater wonder that so few were wounded or killed. Circumstances favored us somewhat, and we took advantage of the situation, hiding our heads behind stumps and logs, and thus sheltering ourselves from the storm of shot and shell. We failed to drive the foe from their entrenchments. We crawled back to our starting place and again formed in line, supposing we were to entrench as General Hancock ordered. But old Tommy gave another order to advance. The 40th New York just swung itself round by a left wheel, and took refuge behind an old line of works. We swung over another works, and here occurred some grand and lofty tumbling. We piled over the works in a most unmilitary manner. On the side toward the rebels was a body of troops lying flat on their faces in the dirt. We knew nothing of them till we mounted the works, and were then in too much of a hurry to stop for an introduction. In the common danger, we waved all courtesy and jumped right down onto them, regardless of landing place. They took our sudden arrival with surprising good grace. A kick in the head is preferable to a bullet in the head, 
All day we held the position and hugged the earth with wondrous persistence. The hours crept on like snails, and it seemed as if night would never come. It was suffocatingly hot, and we baked like the festive bean. The rebs were so near that we couldn't lift hand or head without danger of having it perforated. Sometime during the afternoon, old Tommy Egan, who got us into this scrape, received a dig in the region of his kidneys, which deprived us of his company. With astonishing complacency, we watched him drag to the rear. If any tears were shed, they were tears of joy mingled with the hope that his wound will keep him away till our terms end. A little before sunset, we were ordered out. We backed out, one by one, hoping our movement would not be noticed by the Johnnies. A grand charge was to be made all along the line, and thus, wind up the show for the day. Our division was to act as a reserve, and we were stationed near where we started, not far from the hare house. As our troops advanced, the musketry fire was just terrific, and I thought that if the loss of life bore any proportion to the noise, our army must be melting away like butter under a July sun. It was a continuous roar, now dying away, now swelling like the surf on the shore. Our advance was a dismal failure, although a trifle more territory was gained. The Rebs fell back to another line in rear and couldn't be dislodged, so nothing more was done, and we passed the night on the estate of one O.P. Hare. June 17th. Put under arms at daylight and about seven o'clock were ordered out into the front line of works. We moved part way and then waited a long time for the troops who were in there to crawl out one by one. There is but little space between the enemy lines and ours at this place, just a narrow ravine separating us, and our friends across the way keep up a continual fusillade. For a man to raise his head is equivalent to signing his death warrant. As soon as the other troops got out, we crawled into their places, and although there was a storm of lead flying about, we contrived to get in without losing a man in our company. We now had a chance to pay back Johnny Reb. We have some excellent sharpshooters, in no way inferior to the Rebel article, besides being much better armed. After dark, the second division of this corps, the second, crawled up the ravine in our front, and by a sudden rush on the enemy broke through their lines and sent them flying. It was but a few moments' work to clear the entire line, and this we proceeded to do. June 18th. About daylight we moved forward in line of battle, intending to charge the entire length of the line. As we emerged from the woods, we found the Confederates had completely evacuated the area. Instead of a charge, we simply took possession. We could see them clawing over the hills towards Petersburg, and if we could have gone on, we would have kept them going. Instead, we were ordered to halt and throw up entrenchments. When the Johnnies discovered this, they ceased running and commenced digging in, right in plain sight on Cemetery Hill. Each regiment sent out one company to cover its front, and Company I was chosen as skirmishers for our regiment. We harassed them for a spell, but their sharpshooters secured a lodgment so near that they had us right in their sights. We advanced to the crest of a hill in a field of oats and concluded that if we could establish a position there, we might check these fellows. It was soon discovered, however, that our position was incompatible with keeping a whole skin, so we retired behind the crest and thence to the rear of the hill. Here we discovered a patch of ground with a lot of guarding sass. The very thought of fresh vegetables made me throw away all caution. I ambled up over the hill to a shed near the garden entrance. No sooner did I appear than I was met with rifle shots from some unknown party occupying the trees in front. When the firing started, I spotted a line of our skirmishers lying flat on the ground. They ordered me to get down. Two years' service in the field have taught me the art of self-preservation, so the advice was entirely gratuitous. In this position, I crawled along worm fashion to the pea patch and soon filled my haversack, remarking to a fellow who was doing the same. Let us have peas. I grabbed as many beets and squash as could be carried by the tops, and with my haversack, told myself to get. I proceeded to crawl out on my belly. On the way, I encountered Billy Patterson. Now Billy, seeing the writer fairly groaning under his load of goodies, decided to go and do likewise. In vain I pointed out the dangers. He declared that he was going into the pea patch at any risk. But the instant he appeared over the hill, 
a bullet struck his belt buckle, and he went hunting grass in a very unceremonious manner. The breath knocked out of him. He didn't care to run that risk again. He was suffering from a pain in the abandon, as an illiterate person once said. When I reached the post, it had lost one of its complement. Jimmy Taylor had been hit in the head and, although living, was unconscious and fast passing away. I found Stacy doing all he could to put space between him and the enemy. He was burrowing for dear life, expecting any moment to join Taylor. We laid our dead to one side and with heavy hearts finished our works of protection. It was intensely hot, the dirt was baked hard as a rock, and bayonets were our only tools. After several laborious hours, I was finally able to cook the stuff found in the garden, but it didn't taste as I'd hoped. The experiences and labors of the day had killed my appetite. Along towards sunset, we took care of Taylor's body, after removing such mementos as could be sent to his family. The firing was so lively that it wasn't safe to go to the rear, and we suffered severely from lack of water. It was evident that the rebels were heavily reinforced at this point. This morning we had them on the run, and had we moved, Petersburg would have been ours. A goodly number of our men have fallen. I call it murder, for whoever ordered this halt is to blame for our predicament. And now we were to be sent forward again, only to be hurled back torn and bleeding, a curse on those responsible. Company I, being on the skirmish line, didn't have to participate in this latest charge, but we have seen our share of death this day. After dark we threw up some works in front of our skirmish line. The Confederates also built one and when morning dawned we found ourselves in uncomfortable proximity, in fact, so near that a stone could easily be thrown from one to the other. This state could not long endure, and the Reb sharpshooters suddenly cleared our part of the line. We moved out and formed another line a few rods in rear of this dangerous section, remaining out all night on the skirmish line. June 19th. After sunrise we were relieved from the picket line and went a short distance to the rear. A place had been left for us on the works, rather a place for us to build up. We labored under several disadvantages, the chief one being lack of timber for the breastworks. This could only be procured in front, beyond a piece of ground dominated by rebel sharpshooters. We were fortunate not to lose a man from company. I, while running the gauntlet, a fellow named Stearns in Company C was hit in the neck and expired almost instantly. He lived just long enough to gasp. Tell mother I died happy. Rather a sudden way to finish one's pilgrimage, and yet much preferable to the lingering tortures to which others have been subjected. It will seem strange to some that this young fellow in the very bloom of manhood and health could say he died happy. We who know the dreadful suspense and nervous strain of war do not wonder that when he realized he was through it all, he should say he died happy, for he left no wife or little ones behind him. Today, one of our men was wounded in the bayonet. On May 5th, another was wounded in the testament and still another in the diary, neither of whom had his usefulness impaired thereby. The last named individual might have lived a good many years more, but for his subsequent attempt to stop a bullet with his arm, which didn't work so well. A feeling prevails that sooner or later, this experience will befall us all. So we have an indefinable dread, our nerves subjected to a continual strain, which we know cannot end till the war ends, or we are wiped out. We, June 21st. Rations were served to us, and then we started out to destroy the Weldon Railroad, but soon changed our minds. A force of the enemy was there ahead of us, and their intentions did not look peaceful. We contented ourselves with looking at them with unutterable ferocity. Not at all astonished at our audacity, they commenced to throw things at us. Our officers pretended we were on the wrong road and ordered us away from there. We were on the wrong road all right, unless we were in search of destruction or a trip to Richmond as prisoners. Being quite late when we extracted ourselves from this mess, we moved back to the Jerusalem Plank Road and formed in a line with our right near the Jones House. It took a long time to get located, as the trees were very dense and there was a great deal of underbrush to dispose of. We laid here till midnight, when we were ordered out in front. We went over a road cut through the woods and found a line of works thrown up. The second division of our corps had already been out there all day, and we are eternally grateful for their hard labor in throwing up these works. An attack is expected at every moment, so we are kept under arms 
and ordered to stay awake. This last order we obey, but of what use are pickets if those in the works can have no sleep or rest? June 22nd. The 2nd Brigade of Bernie's Division and the whole of Barlow's were sent but a short distance in front to establish another line and throw up some works. Everything went on swimmingly for a time, and we began to relax. General Barlow was so confident that he advanced some distance beyond his command to a little brook into which he projected his feet. A rebel yell at his elbow brought this refreshing performance to a sudden end. Seizing his stockings and shoes, the general fled to the uttermost parts of the field, the rebels at his heels. He reached the works only to find that the Confederates had made a savage onslaught on them at this point. His right wasn't much better, and the Rebs were fast turning it. Men were flying in all directions, some to the front, but not voluntarily. Death filled the air like snowflakes in a winter storm. Most of the men sped in the direction of the works behind which our company reposed. When we found them coming, we did wonders trying to urge them to stand fast. We soon became alarmed, for words of encouragement didn't seem to check them, so we added copious threats to punch them with the bayonet if they didn't turn about and check the rebs. Our apparent bravery was the result of our fear that if they didn't stand, we should have to do so. The Union line was in a condition to give our Confederate friends a very sultry reception, if they persisted. A masked battery was just trembling to get a crack at them. But the rebs evidently reconsidered and dropped the pursuit. Our troops in front were too demoralized to attempt any counter-movement and were withdrawn inside the works. General Hancock is away, or this disagreeable affair would never have taken place. General Barlow is chiefly censurable for the entire transaction. It is an open secret that Barlow isn't just right in his head, and his performance lends strength to this insinuation. The most stupid private, and we have legions of them, would know better than to push a column out in this way. No connection right or left and both flanks in the air. June 23rd. Sometime previous to daylight, we were ordered out front and formed in line of battle in the cornfield where yesterday's combat took place. Just as the gray mists of morning lifted, we charged across the field to the edge of a belt of woods, ending up slightly in advance of yesterday's position. We found here a line of rifle pits partially completed. These we finished and occupied for the rest of the day. An attack was expected at any moment, but no movement of any consequence was made. We found in this field the body of one of our officers who fell in the previous battle. There were indications that while he lay wounded, he was murdered for his clothes. The Yankees are, no doubt, a low-born set, but we have never been charged with murdering a man for his clothes. At night all was quiet except for the festive mosquito and the mournful whippoorwill.